Huh? Look at this thing. It's like the biggest laptop you've ever yeah. seen. Is this, is this the same size like the yeah, old one? Yeah. I thought the. No, it's slightly. Oh, it's slightly big. Oh, oh boy. Is it? Is it? They put the uh, rabbit. I don't know what happened. Okay. Oh, yeah, they crashed some of the people who did it. Is that so 60? They give us the engineering. Okay. Is it a 60 bit or? You don't know. Mm. Okay. To be honest with you. Okay, no big deal. It's fast and it's That's awesome. That's awesome. I'll give you full the screen. That wasn't, uh, no, I think it was the full version. The full version? Yeah. Okay, good. Maybe engineering instead. Engineering instead of business laptops, I guess. Yeah. I know some of you guys might have rabbit related questions about the families. So we'll leave some time where you can ask uh, about the families of um, Color Hammer products. So I'm going to let uh, Todd Christensen continue with the presentation. Switch gears and switch words are coming. Yep. And we'll take like an hour or so. so yep. Kind of an hour. Yep. So if you can uh, right. type in your, your bills and we'll go. All right. Um, so uh, a little bit to finish up on panel boards. This is uh, kind of a graphical format uh, that you guys can also use a reference for uh, selecting panel boards. You'll see we've got versions of Powerline 1A and Powerline 2A, and these are both close to the same panel board. Powerline 1A is your 120-208 volt panel. Powerline 2A is your 482-77 volt panel. So we'll call that a, a lighting panel and a receptacle panel. Both have 400 amps maximum. Branch devices, 100 amps or less. So that is your, your uh, cookie cutter, everyday, hard work and panel board that you're going to put on every floor. 3A is kind of a hybrid panel, um, any voltage. Doubles uh, up to 800 amps for lugs or 600 amps for a main breaker. The key here is you can get up a little higher. You can go up to 225 amp branch breakers. So that gives the ability to mix and match if you wanted to have a uh, either a power panel or a hybrid power panel or you know half of it just lighting 20 amp one pole breakers and the other half a couple of power panel feeders. You can do that. And then uh, the, the upper step for the Powerline 4s, 4B and 4F, breaker and fusible, will go all the way up to 1,200 amps. And I'll include in this the 5P, which is a plug-on breaker, uh, more like a breaker bucket, but it's, uh, it's not very common from a panel board standpoint. It's a high premium with uh, really not getting a whole lot out of it. The theory on the panel board with the plug-in breaker is that you can plug the breaker on and off while the panel board is hot. But if you look at our instructional manual or uh, our competitor's instructional manual or the uh, safety manager at the plant, if that's where you're doing it, not a one of them will say you can do it hot. That's just an old practice and a way to do it. It's, uh, it's really not supported very well from our standpoint. So we'll say in 4B and the 4F, the, the, the bolt-on stuff, the thing to note here is 1,200 amps, maximum amps, including all the way up to the branch device. So you can get, as, as, whether it's main breaker or branch breakers, anything up to 1,200 amps. Todd, if you can go just one step here. <clears throat> the system that we're using right now is 2 120 so the choice PRL1A would be their choice. Yes, okay, yes. So just FYI, the 240 is the highest voltage that you can put in the system. So you, if you're sizing up to 400 AM, what if like some of the students were doing 500, what if this is size broke 500 viewers and grab 500, 600. 600. So if you need a 600 to weight, then you have to jump to basically uh, PRL2A. Or, or yeah, or PRL3 three because of the 600. Amp you're going to go the 600 level. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. We put the maximum voltage, 240 covers 120, 208. But this one says 480, 277, not 480 volts. Why is that? 
because you this panel board, similar to this panel board, takes 480Y <laughs> voltage, but does not accept 480 delta voltage. 480 delta is a uh, uh, requires more installation and a, installation and a little bit higher rating on the panel board or the breakers itself. So that's why this one kind of says a little bit different. If you need a 480 delta panel board, you would actually have to jump up to this one. Uh, nothing on here. This is just to give you a reference for the uh, uh, the different cable sizes from power line ones all the way up to the power line fives, different amperages. Uh, just a good reference. I think the one thing to point out on here is right at the bottom. Uh, let's see. All lug sizes are based upon wire capacities corresponding to NEC. Yada yada, 75 degrees C pump. Okay, it's important to note that all equipment manufacturers, all products, generally speaking, are sized and tested for only 75 degrees C wire. So you can't, uh, you can use 60 degrees C wire, but you can't use the 90 degree C wire. If you use the 90 degree C wire, you have to follow the table over and basically derate it down to the 75 degree C column in the table. Why is that? Because 90 degree C wire is rated for, uh, it will go 15 degrees higher in heat than the 75 degrees, so it'll get hotter. If a wire gets hotter, the lug or the termination gets hotter. If the lug and the termination get hotter, the air in the equipment, the assembly, switchboard or panel board is going to get hotter. Therefore, that whole thing has to get retested by UL, and, and no manufacturers have tested for multiple impasses with UL. So, just uh, these are snapshots. Again, good reference for you. Um, just going to walk through them briefly. The power line 1A panel board, again, here's a good snapshot of what it looks like. Uh, anything less than 240 volts, up to 400 amps for main lugs or main breaker. And our branch breakers are sized at 100 amps. We've got plug-ons, which are basically non-existent because if you've got a panel board with these little 20 amp one pulls, which is like this, and it's a plug-on breaker, cheaper than a panel board with plug-on breaker is a load center with plug-on breaker. Your commercial, res, light, your residential and light commercial load center can carry the same ratings as a panel board, but be much smaller uh, and much cheaper. Okay, so panel board, we're talking about a commercial installation, uh, medium commercial, light commercial residential. A little bit different than breakers. So when we talk about panel board, we almost always then look at the bolt on line, and our family is BAB, is the, the uh, fighting line of the 20 amp one poles. I think we make a million BAB breakers a day. Uh, and then a couple of different variations with ground fault, the GF, and there's ground fault. And, uh, uh, you know, we actually, actually this is a 10,000 amp AIC, 10,000 amp short circuit breaker. Our next level up uh, is a 22. Okay, and just what it looks like on the inside of the panel board. Talked about the can goes on the wall first, the chassis gets mounted in the middle, and then a ground bar actually just mounts in the gutter on the left, and the neutral bar mounts in the gutter on the right, or vice versa. Um, in panel boards, one of the things uh, 
that is quite common in a, uh, installing directly in a pan board is a surge protective device. It used to be called TVSS. And a couple years ago, UL changed the name. They're now called SPDs or surge protective devices. In panel boards, it's an integrated package. It mounts directly on the bus. You can see it right here. There's a little display. This display here is actually right here. So you can't see anything regarding this, this SPT, SPD device, which is, this is what it looks like. So it's pretty thin. It basically would mount uh, across the chassis, and it just bolts right in line into the chassis. Kind of gets out of the way then, so this the interface comes through. And uh, by mounting in the factory, there's no field installation required whatsoever. Number one problem with the operation of an SPD is contractor installation. The the nature of an SPD is that it is designed to reduce the transient voltages in a facility. And I will say there's just a couple of ways that they're going to come. You're going to get uh, from outside the facility, which are lightning strikes, or if you're next to a plant that opens and closes uh, Capacitors online, you got some big switching banks or something that you may get surges that come from outside trying to get into your facility. The SPD will knock that down. You may have things inside your facility that create transient voltages. Copy machine, and fax machine, uh, the nature of these electronic type things, ballasts, the, na the nature of the electronics will put transient voltages across basically your entire facility. It'll go up the line in your panel board, maybe into the next panel board. And by being able to chop down those transient voltages to a more tolerable uh, level, uh, what it will have is the effect of extending the life or not shortening the life of things like laptops. Anything with a microprocessor on there is susceptible to transient voltages. Thinking just about a laptop, um, or if you look at, I guess, just a, an SPD device, they're either going to take, your facility is going to take the knockout punch, which is the lightning strike. Something coming in down the line, comes through the line, and could blow up the switchboard, could come through the switchboard, and take out a couple of TVs. If anybody in their house has had a TV going because of lightning, I know my family did. Um, SPD will dive on the sword, take that punch, and uh, protect your equipment. It may be done, but that's what it's there to do. Likewise, inside your facility, your fax machine, your copier, your ballasts, those are all throwing the jabs. Transient voltage, transient voltage, transient voltage. And after it hits you 10,000 times, eventually you're just going to wobble over and fall down. And that's when your computer fails after a year and a half instead of the three years you're hoping for. So these are two ways their transient voltages can damage your equipment. And both are protected by an SPD device. So I always say um, when you're designing it, any service entrance equipment, whether it's a switchboard, panel board, needs to have highly recommended some type of surge protective device. Then you look at the critical nature of what kind of loads, what's in your facility. If I'm a school, I would say there's going to be a lot of computers or a hospital or anything along those lines. You should add multiple layers downstream. TVSS or SPD at the main service entrance. A couple more at some critical distribution panel boards. And then you go right on down to your lighting and receptacle panel and pick out the ones that feed the critical loads and put that third level in even one down. So, SPDs. Uh, yeah. It's going to depend on the rating, but uh, installed, it will range between, I'll say, $1,500 up to about a maximum of, say, $3,500. And they come with different ratings. <coughs> Excuse me. And the ratings are similar to the short circuit. They're a KA rating. 
100 ka 200 ka and uh, the ka rating is kind of fooled fool it fools you a little bit because it tells you how much the largest strike it could take but in reality it will never take a strike that large i think the largest recorded lightning strike has only been 200 ka and that'll never be that much by the time it gets into your facility so really what you're talking about is the how long it's going to last is it going to last and these all come with 10-year warranties it's an industry standard deal but is it going to last 10 years 15 years 30 years longer than the life of your building at what point do you know that you need to replace it what uh what we've done and i think a lot of manufacturers have done this is put in indicator lights and this is an older style this isn't our newer style but our newer style now has say three green lights three green lights are constant so you don't ever have to go push a button and check or is it working is it working three green lights are constant when a uh, one of the phases fails whether it's a lightning strike or you know a lot of internal transients or maybe there was a manufacturing defect then one of the lights or all the lights will go out or turn red. So when the light turns red, then it's call up so and so right here and replace it. Um, these are mounted in the panel. You can also buy them loose for mounting next to a panel. That's where I was saying the, the number one failure of a SPD is uh, uh, the installation by the contractor. A, an SPD device, because it's transient voltage surge protection, um, there's a certain amount of let through voltage that it will let through as part of your normal voltage wave. Built into this device will have a fixed let through device. Let's say if I'm on a 208 volt system, I will let through uh, 400 volts repeatedly. Connecting, and here's actually your wires, connecting these wires to a panel board breaker, for example, to mount this alongside of it. For each inch of wire that you're connecting, you add 20 volts of let through voltage to your SPD device. And every time you add one inch and add 20 volts of let-through voltage, you decrease the performance of your SPD. So if you talk, uh, which we recommend, if you do a need to mount it to the existing equipment and you mount on the side, and you mount two feet of wire, two feet, 24 inches times 20 volts an inch is a little less than 500 volts of let -through. So all of a sudden, your 400 volt let through became an 800 volt or 900 volt let through device. And just by thinking about it, it's not going to perform as good. It's going to do just as good on high transients, but it's probably going to let some of those lower transients get through. Other questions on SPDs? How do you tie it into the panel? Where do you laminate it? The, uh, when we factory mount it, it's actually these are little copper pieces so the copper pieces on this device actually bolt right to the bus bars right to the ABN bus ABNC bus bar and any transient voltage that comes up say a feeder breaker back to the panel board and once it hits the main bus the SPD will take care of the transient off the main bus if you were going to side mount it you basically put a uh, like a 30 amp three pole breaker and then connect these wires to the, to the three pole breaker and mount it in a can say right next to the panel and when you do that this will still look at your bus still look at your ABNC bus but rather than chopping it off at a lower let through voltage it'll basically double it. Pass that around. Yep. Right, so you just disconnect that tail if it goes right on the... Yeah if uh, um, you mean for mounting this way right on the bus? That's a good question, actually, because we got a couple of different ways we do it. Normally, we'll mount it right on the bus 
and the only disconnect will be the main breaker and the panel or the upstream breaker if you got a main line going. So if there was a failure for some reason and you needed to replace it, you would have to shut down the panel to take it out and put a new one in. When we get to switchboards, we actually, the bigger devices, because they're a little tougher to shut down, we'll put a three-pole breaker, say here. I'm not going to touch the screen. Say we'll put a three-pole breaker here and wire up to this SPD device and keep the length as minimum possible. Maybe there's six, eight inches in there that we use to feed that. And then that's strictly a disconnect means, a way to turn it on and off to isolate it if you need to pull it out of the panel. Does that answer your question? Anything else in SPDs? Okay. Uh, power line two panel boards looks pretty much the same as the power line one. Remember this, the only thing different here is it's a 48277 volt panel. So your receptacle panels are here. Uh, same thing up to 400 amps, lugs or breaker. Our fighting line on the 100 amp max branch breakers is the GHBs or the GQs. These two are your 20 amp one pole, 30 amp three pole breakers. Okay, power line three panel boards. Notice this one is a whole much higher. This is the hybrid panel, somewhere between a lighting receptacle and a power distribution. In fact, you can do both right down here at the bottom. I'll call that lighting and receptacle breakers. Same 20 amp breakers you would get in your uh, in your power line ones and twos. And we've got some, say, 225 amp breaker feeder breakers here that may feed a couple other distribution panels. And then uh, main breaker at the top. So it's a good hybrid panel. Any voltage. 800 amp for lug, 600 amp max for a main breaker. And 225 amp max branch breaker. Why do we call it a hybrid? Is it bigger? I just call it a hybrid. It's my name. Um, I call it a hybrid because you can have this panel where all your 20 amp and you know these kind of breakers. This is this better way to do it. Your power line ones and twos are going to have 20 amp one poles. 30 amp three poles, a breaker like this, nice and small, very cost effective, easy to mount. And yet, you can also have these type of breakers, which in a power distribution panel, you can have 600, coming, 600 amps coming in, and maybe you want to take three sub panels out of there. So you can get yourself a 225 amp breaker like this to feed another panel board which has another 42 of these. So now I've got the capability to mount both of these on the same chassis. Otherwise normally you can see they probably wouldn't fit. Um, and then the other thing, notice we added uh, no voltage restrictions on three phase three wire with no neutral. So from that standpoint, it's a good industrial pan, industrial facilities that have a lot of motors. Uh, sometimes you'll have no need for a neutral. They'll use these panels more frequently. Okay, a little bit, a little bit odd looking is that uh, we kind of put the, the neutral actually in the middle of the panel versus gutter mount. And then uh, here's what it looks like when you combine um, the chassis, the power distribution channel, panel, and the uh, chassis of the lighting receptacle panel. And looking into your power line four panel boards, these are again our power distribution panels. Um, this one is probably 90 inches high. The smallest you can get this panel in is 53 inches high. 
Uh, very tough to even see them that small. Usually they're either 73 or 9 inches tall. So these are big panels. Um, circuit breakers or will show fusible. 1200 amps. Now that's a, uh, it's a good number to remember because the difference between panel boards and switchboards, which we'll come into here in a sec, the largest panel board is 1200 amps. And 1200 amps is the standard uh, uh, cutoff when you consider switchboard or panel board. 1200 <laughs> amps is a cutoff, good cutoff. And any higher than 1200 amps, you got no choice. And the power line forward. Well, this is just a snapshot of the molded case breakers. Um, this is the, uh, that's a 1200 amp breaker, I believe, right here. And this one is this size. Okay. Just to give you a difference in the sizes. So twice as big, two or three times as wide. And trying to get that handle, if you know the way a circuit breaker works, there's a toggle mechanism on the inside, so they kind of snap. Trying to get these handles to open and close on a circuit breaker that big, you almost always got to have an extension. You put a little extension that we ship with them to open it up and down. And you got to have some strong hands. But use that to give you a guide of how much space is my panel board going to take? Why, how come I can't fit everything into one structure like the line paper it looks it should be doable and I tell you it's going to take two structures? This is one of the reasons the bigger equipment you have or the bigger amperages you have, the more space this is going to take up. In the worst case scenario on space is fusible. And I would say is yeah, I know we're a breaker circuit breaker company. We don't make fuses, but we make fusible switches to put in here. But uh, the number one detriment I would say in fusible switches is the space. This is uh, probably a say a 60 amp switch, a couple of 30 amp switches, and a 100 amp switch, and then maybe two 200 amp switches, and that almost fills up an entire panel board. I could take that much in a circuit breaker panel and probably put it in about this length. Big difference in space requirements. And if you've got a, a switchboard, for example, um, well, let's just look at this panel board example. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six feeder devices into this usable switch panel board. And it's say it's pretty close to full with six feeder devices. I can put 18 circuit breaker feeder devices in this same footprint versus six in a fusible. And you translate that out to a switchboard, and the difference may be between three structures for circuit breakers, six structures for fusible switches. And now you're talking square footage. There's not a building built anywhere where the architect can't tell you exactly what it costs per square foot. They'll tell you my square footage is $205 per square foot. So if you're taking up an extra 30 square feet because your switchboard is fusible, then you owe me, you know, 13 times $200 for that. They'll know, and that's valuable, especially when you get when you get into something like a uh, like a Best Buy, a retail place. Every square footage you can save them from invisible infrastructure that they don't want to see it, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to know it's there, to where you can take that off, make a little extra room in the equipment room, make a little more showcase room, and put one more big screen TV for display. That's money to them. So that's that's when you ask those guys who are building that, that is one of the, the most important things that they're going to look at. Just don't take up my square footage. And that's just what it, again, it gives you a view of what it looks like in the side, in the uh, on the inside of that. Um, you'll notice one of the other things I want, I guess, to point out on this power on these power line fours. 
there's no door because they're power distribution panels. You don't have a door that locks this dead front from all the circuit breaker panels. You are pretty much looking at just a dead front trim where your handles or your operating mechanisms are all facing. So it is a, a something to, to distinction. And uh, there's no rule saying you can't put circuit breakers and fusible switches in the same uh, in the same panel board. I think we just have to take a uh, small spacer and put it in between. But uh, you may have cases where you've got some motors that you want to feed, and you got to have a fuse to protect the motor. It's the best thing that works with this one. But yet you got to have a couple circuit breakers, um, or you want to have a couple circuit breakers. You can do that as well. And then, uh, you know, again, everything takes up the space. The way the industry calls it is X space. You guys heard X space? We, in in uh, industry sizing terms, I think this actually started with Westinghouse. Everything is designated in X space. So one pole of a circuit breaker is an X space. And an X space, I think, don't write this down, is one and three eighths inch. But it makes it easier when I say, this is 3x of space versus this is 4 and 7 eighths inches. So when I'm sizing panel boards, I'm looking at how much x space does it require. You know, three breakers is 9x, so main breaker is another 3x, a neutral is 10x, and I don't know exactly how many x's fill it up, and that's how I translate it into x height, and you get a table and it tells you box height. But just be familiar, if you hear that, that's where that came from. And that, that's our side of the fence. That shouldn't be your side of the fence. But You know, everything nowadays is, uh, there's a lot of lead discussion, metering, monitoring. Uh, I need to get my energy use, I need my KW, my KWH. For lead points especially, we are seeing a lot of ways where people want to monitor individual loads. Tenant meter. Be aware that whether it's power line fours or even switchboards, we have devices, all manufacturers have devices that, for lack of a better word, we can snap right on the bottom if you want it on one of these circuit breakers. With those, uh, you can see the ABC, you can basically sit right on top of that. Or you can take this and mount it in the side gutter. But that's going to measure your amperage. And uh, it'll take your voltage input. And it'll output KW or KWH. Uh, most commonly to like a building management system. So you can take it out in some mod bus form of communication or Ethernet form of communication. And bring that in and be able to gather that data. Send out energy bills or track usage over time to see how much energy you save when you replace the 30 year old HVAC unit from last, you know, with a new one last year. How much energy did I save when I paid the extra upgrade to get a better efficiency? All that's out there nowadays. And it's just different methods for uh, metering. Probably a good question for you. Yep. So you meter, you break your meter, you get a breaker on the meter, or you find your meter directly to the bus? Um, for our meter, we'll do uh, we'll do a. Should I draw right now? No, then I got yeah, it. Uh, this would be better over here, We'll do for the PTs. We'll tap directly off the bus. So we'll tap on a bus. This is all ABC. So we'll tap directly off the bus away from contact for anybody. 
will wire out into a PT disket. And this will be a um, little switch, no bigger than a hand. And it's just a little 90 precision switch on off. That allows you to isolate it at this point. Okay? And then this will be your A, B, and C that go into your meter. CTs, same theory, but rather than a CT disconnect, we'll wire these into a uh, shorting block. And the shorting block allows you to dial a couple screws in to basically isolate this from the meter. So then this will be your meter here with uh, voltage inputs and current inputs. And all this is built into the meter. And all this is built in. So when it hits the site, you're looking at a meter on the front of your equipment, and then you'll open that. Maybe there'll be a hinge door behind there, and in behind the meter in the hinge door will be all the factory wiring all set. So there shouldn't be anything to do other than maybe turn the PTs close to on your voltage source. Okay, switchboards. Talked about panel board being 1200 amp main bus maximum. Uh, switchboard goes all the way up to 6000. And, you know, I don't know if it shows this very good, but uh, we've talked about the differences between panel boards and switchboards. The easiest way to distinguish it, you don't want to talk amperages or numbers, a panel board hangs on the wall, a switchboard stands on the floor. So, you got to think about how you're supporting it. Now this, this panel board, it's 1200 amps, it's pretty big and it looks like it's sitting on the floor, but in addition to sitting on the floor, it's only 11 inches deep or 10 and a half inches deep, so it has to have, basically be bolted to the wall or some type of tie to the wall, support to the wall. A switchboard definitely is standing on the floor and it can be mounted right into the middle of the room. doesn't need to be bolted or supported by anything. Uh, stripping off the side sheets, you can see this is a framework. So you've got, you know, simple uh, steel frame at the bottom and at the top and at the four corners up and down. And basically they're sheet steel around the outside. All the bus work is in the middle. You can see here is A phase, B phase, C phase. And there might be a neutral in there somewhere. And all this will be behind the breakers, which would be behind here. So again, it's freestanding. Switchboards can be front or rear or both accessible. 6,000 amp main bus, 5,000 amps is the largest device main breaker. Um, for all practical purposes, 4,000 amps is pretty much the general cutoff rule of how big we make switchboards. We do make them bigger, but I'll call that for a, uh, a data center application, a generator application, a commercial distribution building typically stays at 4,000 amps or less. Utility metering, and uh, I'm going to leave that up there for now, <laughs> where we can put uh, off-circle back then. Utility metering can be put in there. We'll put a utility metering compartment in there, and they can padlock it, and it's theirs. Customer metering, and I think here, just know the difference. Utility metering and customer metering, or user metering. This, and what we just showed, and what I draw up here, is called customer metering. Strictly by the customer, the owner can get in there, and it's the owner's meter. Utility metering, even though it's in the, the owner's switchboard, owner owns a switchboard, but utility is going to put a padlock on there, and the utility will own everything inside that padlock. So they'll come on, and they'll open this little, maybe it'll be this door down here, Something like that. They'll open it. They'll put in their metering PTs and CTs. They'll seal it. They'll lock it up. And you won't have any access to it. So just distinguish between those two. 
And switchboards are UL891 uh, product. It's kind of how all everything fits into one. Here's utility metering, main device, main breaker there, customer metering there. Group mounted distribution. One thing I'll say on utility metering now. It used to be, and I say used to only a couple years ago, everything in the Excel area here, primarily we'd put a metering compartment inside of the switchboard. And recently they have since changed and Excel now puts their utility compartment outside. So there's companies like AMP or EMI, if you're familiar, local pin vendors will make these little CT cabinets you can take put it on the ground and that allows Excel to access that without having to go inside the building you know and get the owner to get them into the room and get into the cabinet or what have you. So that's just one of the changes that they've implemented recently. Okay for your main device same as the breaker then or the uh, same as the panel board that we were looking at. Main lugs, main fusible switches, and main circuit breakers. There's a couple of different types of fusible switches. Our family is the FDP or FDPW family at 1200 amps and below. Once you get above 1200 amps, the only thing available for a fusible switch is a bolted pressure switch. Uh, Eaton Manufacturers, uh, we bought a company called Pringle a couple of years back, and there's a couple other bolted pressure switches like uh, uh, Bolt Lock and uh, a couple other of those, but uh, a bolted pressure switch is the only one you can get for ground fault applications. So your 1200 amp and less fusible switches, uh, you do not have the ability to trip these. You can only blow a fuse. A bolted pressure switch, you can see it's much bigger. This is actually the handle neck here. And this is the only device from a fusible switch standpoint that you can put a ground fault relay in there and trip it if you get a ground fault. From a circuit breaker standpoint, we've got basically three types. We've got a molded case circuit breaker. And that's, that's these. You can see it's molded case. It's a thermal resin, engineered thermal resin composite. Plastic. It's the outside. Um, and just a simple toggle mechanism on the front. On and off. Insulated case. We'll come back to air power circuit breaker. Is much bigger. The Rather than uh, be that size, I say you're probably talking 80 to 100 pounds and you're maybe this tall and this wide. Air power circuit breakers have the, they're 100% maintainable. They are, uh, you basically rip, rip them down, open them up to the spring, to the washer, to everything down on the inside. They are, they have a, a two-step stored energy mechanism on the inside like a spring and a motor. So you can open and close them electronically. In other words, you can go back to your DCS system, uh, a push button on the other side of this wall, and sit there and open and close your main device without ever having to be at it. And that's the beauty of these air power circuit breakers. The insulated case breaker is really tested and built to the same standards as a molded case breaker but you get the ability of the two-step stored energy device, which is being able to open and close it remotely. Can you do that through a computer? Yes. <clears throat> Basically, any, any drive contact. So your most common applications of an air power circuit breaker, I did it again, are uh, your most common applications, if you think about a data center, or a utility where you can have a, uh, a big wall of lights and push buttons and you want to say okay you're, you're out you're looking at your power and you say we're drawing too much over here let's uh, 
let's shift some load over to here. So you can hit a couple of buttons, whether it's a computer, a PLC, or some manual button here you're pushing. And boom, you can open a circuit breaker in the equipment room on that side of the building. You can close the circuit breaker in the equipment room on that side and be able to do that basically by sitting at a control panel or looking at your PC. If I can inject something, you can't collect a contact for this in the unit. Really, you can, you can make them a, a correct me if I'm wrong, you can make them a motor starter. You can start the motor by uh, one of these in bigger motors. Yep. Start them and stop a big motor for them. So, I don't know what the utility is. So. Yep. And just FYI, guys, the, the industrial project that's coming, we're going to be specifying the air power certifications next quarter. So, when we export to it. Well, I'll we'll tell you one difference. And, uh, and this is the air power circuit breakers, as well as medium voltage to get into 5 kV or 15 5 kV motors. A circuit breaker, uh, when you're talking about motor starting, think about the number of operations. A circuit breaker has a much lower number of mechanical operations than a contactor. And that's one thing, uh, a lot of people use breakers, and that's fine if you start them uh, every other day or whatever. If you have a planned maintenance schedule, that's fine. But a lot of times you may get an application where you start it up five times a day, and you're opening and closing that breaker, then you may want to think that better be a contactor application versus a circuit breaker application. So just know that there is a difference. But on the insides, it's the same thing. So two contacts, open and close. Uh, here's the next size up, by the way. Molded case circuit breakers for switchboards go up to 2,500 amps. So this one is this one. And this is your 2,500 amp breaker here. That thing's a beast. How many watts? One X. That one is a, uh, you're probably a 7X because you're turning it sideways, first of all. So, yeah, it's probably maybe an 8X. But actually, you can't, uh, the problem is you can't individually mount them. Yeah, or you can't mount them on a chassis to add your X space because they're so heavy. It's in, it takes up half a structure. You literally have to individually mount it and run your. Feed each one with its own copper coming in and or out of it. Uh, a little better pictures of uh, bolted pressure switches. They go up to 5,000 amps. I think they go up to 4,000 here, but I'm thinking 5,000 amps. Um, they do have a high AIC rating, so 200,000 amp interrupting current which is, uh, you know, tied to actually the fuse itself. So that is a good benefit of a uh, bolted pressure switch. And just the difference, manually operated, which is the same open-close function as a circuit breaker, and electrical trip, which is when we talk most commonly used with a ground fall protection scheme, which will come into, it's probably coming up next year. And this is your air power circuit breaker, a little better picture. The air pod, uh, these can be uh, the air power circuit breakers. Our version is the Magnum DS. That's our family there. And you can get those in fixed or draw out mount. So when I say fixed, you take a breaker, you put it in, you bolt it. The only way you can get the breaker out is to unbolt everything and pull it back out. Draw out mounted is. Uh, there's basically a giant cassette that you mount inside the switchboard. So you mount the cassette, and then there's rails, so the breaker itself slides in and out. And why would that be beneficial? If you like to do maintenance, you can do maintenance every year, pull a breaker in and out of there very quickly. If you want to shorten downtime, if downtime is critical, and you ever did need, a, uh, need to replace a breaker, the uh, breaker could be removed in and out fairly quickly and limit your downtime. Uh, so 
So switchboard uh, main devices, um, this is a fixed one. Usually uh, individually mounted. When I say individually mounted, I'll say one or two hyperstructure. Apple structure in this case. At 1200 amps and less, you can chassis mount. That's where we get into the X phase today. But uh, you can chassis mount it at 1200 amps and less. And when I say chassis, 1200 amps, basically you're talking about a panel. So if you looked at a switchboard that was 1200 amps, it's virtually the same thing as the panel. In fact, the chassis that we put in here is the same. One more details on the utility metering compartment. How that used to be is this here is the CT. It's called a bar type CT. Bolted here, bolted here. All the current runs through it. Versus normally you'd see a donut CT where you put the cable that goes through the donut and then the CT reads the uh, current going through the cable. Utilities do a little different. And here's just a little bit better picture. They tap off, uh, maybe not in the switchboard now, but say this is outside in a uh, metering box. They'll put their CTs in, and they'll be a wire or two wires up each CT, and that'll be to their meter, which is is uh, how they figure out how much to uh, how much to charge people. And here's the other type with a donut type. Uh, this is just for reference. There's a hot sequence and a cold sequence when people talk about uh, metering uh, compartments, how utilities will allow you to set that up. Hot sequence is the utility compartment is always hot. It's always energized. Here's your incoming. Here's your utility. Here's your break. Cold sequence is uh, compartment is cold when the main device is open. So main device main breaker, utility. Hot sequence is the standard for what Excel used to do and what most other utilities do. And anybody got to want to guess why that probably is? Uh, think about it this way. If you open that main, uh, or if you, if you double tap off the lugs here, anything, anything here is not being metered. In other words, the customer is getting free. Versus here, anything the customer does, he has to pay for. That's my theory. Uh, and this is just a little bit better picture of this is the top of a switchboard here with the customer meter mounted here. And you can see a little handle maybe right here. And that handle would be the hinge door that you, when you take out two screws, open this door, that meter will have a PP disconnect in the shorting blocks that feed it all pre-wired right behind. Here's what the CTs look like, and that would be these CTs here that feed the meter. This is your normal bus bar, say this is uh, A phase. And this black thing is the CT that literally mounts around the hard bus. So we factory mount that while we're building the switchboard. And uh, I got just a couple of meter pictures, but uh, you know I think the main point is you can get customer meters in a wide variety of flavors now. You can get vanilla, which is ammeter and voltmeter. Maybe that's all you need. Um, and I'll say below vanilla, what is pretty much obsolete is analog. I can maybe, there's like a couple of guys around town who will still use analog because like God, that's the way they've done it. That's the way they'll always do it. But basically, analog meters are just going by the wayside for a normal amp volt application. Um, digital customer metering is much lower cost than it used to be and much more flexible and easier to use. Other than just the amp volt, for example, you can go, we've got a mid-level series where you can add... Uh, 
frequency, power factor, watts, bars, some of the other protective functions if you so desire, all the way up to a full scale, we'll call it a power quality meter, where you can add uh, things like total harmonic distortion, waveform displays, and really get into the nuts and the bolts of your system. And with that, meters that were once always stand alone, where you'd have to come up, you can read some stuff, write it down in your clipboard, how many watts, how many amps. Nowadays, it's, uh, it's almost a given that you'll put some type of Ethernet connection to your meter. So all you do is plug your uh, LAN, just like you guys are probably all wireless here, but if you had the hard cable, you can just uh, plug that into some area in your switchboard, which will wire it out, and you can plug your, your uh, uh, LAN cable into, the, I guess, the Ethernet switch. Have your IT guy or whatever. When they build a building, he'll assign it an IP address, and then your meter will be just like any of the sockets that you may have, and then everything will be available on the Internet. On, a, uh, on your PC or through your building management system or anything you can dream up. Very easy to do nowadays. And uh, uh, talked about the distribution structures of switchboards really just being uh, uh, chassis mounted devices just like a panel board. Individually mounted devices, uh, chassis mounted devices. Were you guys, are you guys following when I say chassis mounted or individually mounted? Chassis mounted devices are if you've got, if this is your A, B, and C bus, you can stack breakers one on top of the other. These things here, boom, 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 all the way top to bottom, as many as you can fit in. When we talk individually mounted breakers, we don't have this chassis for stacking. We have only the horizontal bus, which means I can mount, say, a breaker here and a breaker here, too high. And then the bus work itself, rather than beside the chassis, each one will have to have, you know, its individual run back to the bus and bolted connections. Um, you got to do that on anything larger than 1,200 amps, just because of space considerations. So. We're talking the SPD. Here's one where we actually put the circuit breaker in right here. Put the circuit breaker into the chassis. A couple of, you know, three or five inch copper pieces that feed the SPD. But then it gives you the disconnect. So there's a, the benefit going on the bolt on versus the stamp and then there's your vibration. Mm -hmm. The bolt on versus the side mount? Or just the ones that would uh, just push in. Um, we don't, uh, all of ours are bolt on. Oh, I guess the way to say it. Are you talking breakers or? Yeah. S oh, breakers. Bolt on is, I always say this bolt on is a fixed electrical connection. Tight connections equal less heat loss. Plug-in is not a fixed electric connection. And anything you plug in, even if it feels tight, it's not. There is a little looseness, and you will get heat dissipation at every loose point. And that's why you'll see on a, on a load center like this, a plug-in plug connection, that's just fine because your load's pretty light. It's just nice and simple, nothing critical. Um, any type of commercial or larger installation, I'd say I always use the bolt on, number one, because you know it's a fixed electrical collection. Safety, less heat loss, which means less money you're paying the utility for nothing to use. But... 
then you can get bigger radius. I think the plug-ins, the maximum plug-in you can ever get is 100 amps. And, you know, bolt-on will take care of anything up to 5,000. Okay, same type of sub-metering devices that can be mounted. Um, I think this is my service entrance uh, picture here. And just how this comes through. If this is the building wall, and we might have already touched on this, so I won't get into this too deal, but the utility will come in and do their metering and then penetrate the wall where your main switchboard and all your, your devices downstream are. Uh, service entrance equipment. The equipment must be located near the point where the conductors enter the building. Um, basically, at your main switchboard. Main lug switchboards can be utilized for service entrance, but you have to have six disconnects or less. If you have more than six, and when I say six disconnects, I'll call that feeders even. If you have more than six feeders, you'll need to have a main circuit breaker. Um, and we talked about electrical bond in the panel. It has to be provided between neutral and ground. A service entrance UL label needs to be factory attached. And then we need ground faults for anything at 1,000 amps or more with a Y voltage of more than 150 amps, 150 volts to ground. So summarizing that, it would be anything over a thousand amps on a 482.77 volt system. Y system, I should say, not delta. But utilities pretty much exclusively will give you a Y system. Um, and as the, at the bottom, check marked in red, uh, utility or sorry, sorry, service entrance equipment must be specified on the order. We can't do that in the field legally. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the service entrance. So let me ask you this: uh, What do you figure? What is service entrance? Why are they Why are they going between one main disconnect or six disconnects? What's the purpose of service entrance equipment? Who needs to know where that is? Fireman. Fireman. Service entrance is driven by, I'll say, I don't know if it's fire code is the right word, but if there's a fire at your facility and the fire department needs to come in and uh, start turning things off and shutting down power, you don't want the fireman to have to be going do 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 up and down, turning breakers on and off. That's why you want one sticker, preferably one breaker to turn off, or at the maximum six breakers to turn off right next to that sticker that clearly identifies that as a service entrance panel. As in a picture. Okay, a little visual on the neutral disconnect link where we've got our A, B, and C in neutral coming in. And a, uh, a neutral link, which ties this, your actually your ground bus at the bottom. Okay, a couple things briefly on uh, ground fault protection. Ground has a high resistance. If you do have a ground fault, because ground inherently there's a lot of resistance in it, your currents are going to be pretty small. Simple formula, low currents, high resistance, equal 40 volt. Um, therefore, here's an example where you got a 2,000 amp circuit breaker. If you get a ground fault off one of the phases, and there's a lot of resistance in there because this is circling all the way through and finding its path back uh, upstream somewhere, you may get a ground fault somewhere on the magnitude of 300 amps. So if you got a 2,000 amp breaker, you got a fault condition, but it's only 3,000 amps, 
you ever going to get that circuit breaker to trip under its normal trip unit in that circuit breaker? No. So that's why ground fault protection is looked at differently than any of your other tripping characteristics on a circuit breaker. So when we look at ground fault, um, we look at ground fault protection in one of two ways. We've got a zero sequence and a residual method of ground fault. They're pretty close, but just subtly different. A zero sequence uses a single transformer around all the phases. The residual type uses individual CTs around each individual phase. What does that mean, or why do I care? Just a little bit better picture of it here. At each, at any snap, snap, any instant in time, current on A, B, C will always be flowing one way or the other. Any load unbalancing will be current that you'll see in the neutral. A CT around all these phases, a snap point in time is going to look at all the currents going. And if no ground fault is current is coming up, it's going to show zero. Because 10 amps current flowing this way and 10 amps current flowing this way are going to be seen as zero amps. So the CT will output zero amps, which will be going into a ground fault relay. This ground fault relay will have a contact closure that will then be tied into the to the shunt trip on the main breaker, what's going to sh shut down your main device. That will activate at a given amps that you put in. So like this, ground fault here, uh, it's sensing some type of imbalance that there is some ground fault flowing, contact closes, main breaker trips. Okay, the residual which is how circuit breakers are done. Okay, so the zero sequence scheme I showed you for reference, a circuit breaker trip unit is done this way. I've got a CT around C phase, around B phase, around A phase, and then one that you got to pull your neutral through. Okay, for the neutral on a circuit breaker, how many poles do you guys see here? Okay, I see three. A phase, B phase, C phase. When we call them, uh, we're talking circuit breaker, we call the phase a pole. So A is a pole, B is a pole, C is a pole. So you got A, B, and C. Where's your neutral? You don't have one in a circuit breaker. Your neutral is always landed separately from a circuit breaker. Generally landed separately from a circuit breaker because there are four, there are certain applications where you have a four pole device. Therefore, to do a ground fault, you have to always measure your current balance that's going to flow in the neutral. So you have to take your cable and put the CT, put your neutral cable through the CT. That will give you a neutral. At a service entrance point, we do that on the bus work. You know, we'll go ahead and mount that itself because there will be a bus a, a place on the neutral that you can mount that. So in this case, you're going to have currents going this direction, currents going that direction, currents going that direction, currents going that direction. Each one, it's going to have its own snapshot in time of different currents. And all of those CTs are right inside the circuit breaker trip unit itself. So you won't even see those. Those are behind the cover inside. The neutral is going to be external. Okay, so that will be the one you have to run your cable. And lad those, oh, lost a picture here. It'll add all those up. This ground fault relay will add them up. So it'll say 10 that way, 10 that way, 5 that way, 3 that way. That sum is 0, which is everything's good, or there'll be some kind of offset, which will mean there's a ground fault condition. And then main, uh, main device may be tripped at that case. Um, just a picture here to show you how switchboards are constructed. We look at a one-line standpoint on the design, put some kind of metering dis 
symbol or display at the top. You've got lines for lugs and neutral, which go flow through uh, utility metering if needed. Might have some PTs, service disconnect or main breaker. Might have some CTs here. And then this, this is uh, your horizontal bus, which runs from structure to structure to structure. So on a switchboard, we can just keep both structures on as we're expanding. As many structures as you need all get spliced to this horizontal bus. Each horizontal bus then will have vertical bus that is built inside the structure. The vertical bus is, is similar to just a switchboard chassis. Where you can then have all your branch devices just mounted right on there. Okay, sometimes you may just have a dedicated pull section. When I think about uh, a 4,000 amp main breaker, 4,000 amps worth of cable. I know some of you guys were contractors here, but if you can think about 4,000 amps of cable, how many that is per phase? Who's good at math? 12, 12 phases? 12,500 is per phase. Okay, three phases, that's 36. You got neutral cables, that's 48. So now you're talking terminating 48 500 MCM cables, or KCMIL. What do you call it now? KCMs. So all of a sudden you got 48 cables you got to terminate. Well, that's a lot of bending and stuff. So in that case, it's very typical to look at a separate dedicated structure just to be able to manhandle all those cables. Now, we don't make cables or we don't do the installation, so as a manufacturer, I'm not that concerned with how you do it, but I guarantee your contractor will love you if you, if you leave room for a cable uh, pull section like that on a, uh, on a large amperage project. And then really just the switchboard is just putting all the pieces together. Uh, we talked about cable. We didn't necessarily talk about bus duct yet. I don't know if you've gotten into bus duct. Okay. Just to make sure you're aware of it, there's an alternative to cable called busway. Busway is, um, say, quarter by six inch copper bus bars, just like what you'd see for horizontal bus in a switchboard. And we can take your vertical bus on the switchboard here, put this together, and take it out of the top and busway. So this may be, uh, in this case, it's a main device. So rather than have to come in with 48 cables to get your 4,000 amps, you get 4,000 amp rated busway, which is going to be about this big. Bolt that from, say, switchboard number one, back here down to switchboard number two, bolt it to the roof, and it bolts directly on it. And then there's a flange that, once it enters right inside the switchboard, It'll spray out or fan out and connect right to the uh, to the flange connections that are manufactured by the switchboard. So busway is A phase insulation, B phase bus bar insulation, C phase insulation. So they're very low, very compact, very quick to install. And look out for more uh, more fun with busway next project. Here's what it looks like physically. This part is the part that runs instead of the cable. So you cross for a distance, and this, this part here, so it sticks into the switchboard. It separates A, B, and C. So A, B, and C are right next to each other, and then spread out. And just up what I guys, bus with a wiring system, they're not panels. So just like you can use conduits instead of unwires, or you can use bus width to take a 2,000 amp from a 4,000 amp switch here, 500 feet, to feed a 2,000 amp switch board. So it's a wiring method. That's exactly so. what it is, wire method. Uh, it can be either copper, copper or aluminum, and the housing is a. Uh, uh, it's either going to be on the aluminum or a steel housing, depending on who's making it for you. So in that case, your housing can actually be considered part of your ground if you wanted to. Uh, 
Uh, that's it for the presentation part. You want me to touch on this? Uh, Let me get rolling. Yeah. Can you just a few things talk about sure. the switch gear? Will you talk about okay. switch gear, which is it's coming just in every two minutes. I know it's cool. Sure. Uh, uh, switchboard and switch gear. Everything we've been talking about now is switch board. Switch gear is a different standard, <clears throat> so it's a different UL standard, different construction standard. And rather than when I talked about uh, chassis mounting all the circuit breakers and having everything being able to be stacked, and if you saw, remember that one picture where everything's open. There's sheet steel around the side and then breakers and bus work on the inside. So if one breaker explodes, it can pretty much go anywhere in, inside of the, of the entire switchboard. Switch gear is manufactured a whole different standard. It's UL 1558, but it's a standard that makes everything in compartments. So your circuit breakers are stacked only four high, and each circuit breaker has got steel sides, steel around the top, and steel in the back. And then horizontal bus runs in the next section, and that's also barrier top to bottom. And the cable compartment is in a whole section behind that, which is barrier. So in a sense, we've got a cable section and a horizontal bus section and breaker sections and the intent is that if there's any failure in any one of those compartments, um, it will have a less, a greater less chance to propagate across the rest of your switch gear. So think about it from the failure slash reliability mode. So it's isolated. It's, it's, it's isolated, yep. Now I can't tell you there's a, a it's not foolproof. There's other ways you can do to make it foolproof, but it's pretty darn close. It greatly increases your chance in a, of uh, a cable that got loose, created an arc. All it does is shut down this one little area. All the other breakers in the lineup work. You get a switchboard and that cable's little arc. Maybe the damage covers across all the sections and the whole switchboard's down for days. Okay, so the construction tied to the reliability is... Uh, the biggest, uh, probably the biggest thing. The other thing is maintainability. Switchboard, predominantly, you're going to see fixed mount of breakers. Everything's bolted. That means if you need to take a breaker off, the whole main device, the whole entire switchboard has to be shut down for you to take a breaker out. So there is an option for draw breakers where you can open the door and rack a breaker out on a, on a rails, for lack of a better word, and then take the breaker out. Switch gear mounting is all draw breakers. So if you get a switch gear assembly, you can put any feeder breaker in and out of the cell at any time while everything is live. So it gives you a greater flexibility as far as maintenance. You know, you can regularly pull things in and out, test them, change the settings, put them back in. Um, gives you the utmost flexibility as far as if you or a lab environment and you change your processes all the time so you're always adding breakers putting things in um, then basically uh, there's a cost difference I guess switchboard is relatively low cost solution a switch gear I'll say is relatively high cost solution and you may be looking at double triple the price so you have to look at it from a cost justification. What's my cost of downtime? What's uh, how much? What's my window to repair? How much flexibility do I need in adding, removing, or maintaining breakers? And uh, the last thing with cable compartments in the rear of switch gear. You know, most of the time you're going to need rear access for switch gear all the way around. So it's bigger, a notably bigger floor floor plan required for switch gear. Anything else? Did I hit on everything? Yeah, absolutely. Is okay. Is any of the multi wire or all branch or branch circuit a breaker? Um. 
the receptacle heart pulse. Heart pulse receptacle. Right you have to, I believe, have to, uh, we might have a, uh, that's a good question. It's not my uh, expertise, but I believe we were having a tandem breaker. But isn't there a code change yeah. coming that makes you uh, remove that common neutral deal? On the arc that's pulse. The arc pulse. pulse. You have, to get an arc pulse to work, you have to have uh, dedicated circuit for everyone. They haven't figured a way to do it yet. They can't bring a circuit to our pulse on a 12, 3, or 4, 2, 3. They can't do it. They have circuits. Uh, no, they don't. Cool. They don't. There might have been a... Yeah. I was thinking I there's a tan. Them, I called them guys directly and they don't do it. <laughs> Call up uh, 8... And they said it's illegal and you can't even get it. That they stopped making it. How does the breaker test on the PDF? Yeah. Okay. Who's Any other is it? Copper hammer. Okay. Is it two uh, tandem, just it's two? Double pull. Okay. That's what I exactly I was thinking. I thought we addressed that. It came it's out got, with but it got outlawed because it's it not legal. It was, that's what I sat and talked to the rec about it. He said you can't use them. They're illegal. And I told him I was using it in Wisconsin. He said, well, you can probably get away with it there. And then he said, uh, but we don't even carry them anymore. That's what he told me. Thanks, so um,